Today, April 22nd, 2014, we find ourselves in Utah Summit County and its county seat, Colville, cruising down the main street to the historic county courthouse, where a year ago, I had the good fortune of meeting Navi Vernon, county historian, who we will now hear from. I will introduce Cordell. He's become my good friend. He came here in the courthouse one day, and ever since we've been good friends, you know, you get to meet some very unique people when you're in the history. But um, Cordell wrote this to me, to put, Dear Hi, You and Your Friends. To begin the new year right, I just posted the dream list of backpacks. I will be working on my 79th and 80th years. 400 miles to go to get to 2,000 miles since 2003. So he's done 1,600 miles of hiking in the U.N.S. And he's got 400 more to go. And he just turned 78, so he's on his 79th yes. year. So we, we brag about it now. We was talking about how age you don't want to tell people how old you are, and then you get like that old, then you're bragging again. <laughs> so I think Cordell's pretty special. He, um, he does have these hikes on the YouTube. Have any of you gone on and seen them? They're wonderful. Get on and watch them because he shows the most beautiful scenery and the UN is, you can't beat it. It's beautiful country. So you want to get on his YouTube videos and look at them. And ooh, he takes pictures of the flowers and the lakes and the animals and the trees. He's very knowledgeable in everything. And he says by the 1st of June, he will be on the KSL radio. And, you, and he calls in from 6 to... It's from 6 to 8 to every eight. Saturday morning. You can't every tell Saturday. Absorbs radio it's called. Yeah, so if you want to hear where he's at and what he's doing, tune in on Saturdays and listen to him. He spent 35 years in Guatemala, so he's very interesting when he tells you about those experiences. He had a mission there for eight years, right? An LDS mission, so... But he's experienced the union for 62 years, so I thought he was pretty knowledgeable. <laughs> so I'll just turn it over to Cordell, and, he, and I'm sure he, if you have questions, ask him about a certain area or anything, he can tell you. And give him a hand. <laughs> I'm getting on the, the video, so I'm going to back off a little bit and get a picture of all of you, if that's all right. Uh, if it's not all right, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> if after about 40 minutes, I have not noticed what time it is, okay. throw something at me. <laughs> uh, because I'd like to leave some time for some questions uh, and some comments. Uh, seeing the group that we've got here, I'm sure there will be people in this room that will be more knowledgeable about certain aspects of the winners than me. And maybe you'll be able to answer some of my questions. There are still some questions that I have not been able to answer about, about the winners. But let me, let me start by telling a little bit about the history. You're going to, uh, did, did they hear what, the, what I'm entitling this speech? Now, no. I didn't probably tell you no. in the beginning, but I did put it on my website. And, and those that are interested in knowing about my website, I've got a whole bunch of cards here. You can pick one up afterwards and so my address, my email, the uh, website is there and you'll be able to get uh, uh, too much information maybe. <laughs> but this is a, uh, I've entitled it, My Love Affair with the High Uinness. Uh, it's mysterious past and present and it's a 62 year love affair now it started maybe just a little preliminary I grew up in California for some reason I loved the outdoors it was maybe the pioneer blood in me Alice Brooks uh, uh, famous from the Martin Hancock company was my great grandmother uh, she's mentioned in some of the uh, documentaries and writings about uh, the Martin Hancock Company. And, and it just is part of my DNA, but I grew up in an urban area where I didn't have any opportunity whatsoever to experience the outdoors. 
As I grew up, once I, at eight years old, I had a steady job delivering newspapers. It was just a uh, weekly newspaper, but I had 200 that I had to deliver to the business area of this little town. It was across the bay from San Francisco called Albany. I put the papers in a tandem bag, pull it over the edge of the table, and then slither underneath and pull it over on my shoulders. I was told that it weighed more than me. And in a way, this, this helped. I, uh, it got a lot of sympathy from all my customers. I earned a lot more in tips than I earned in, in, in wage, which was 50 cents, you know. That, that was big time back then. But I had some money all of a sudden. So I started subscribing to the outdoor magazine. Outdoor Lights, Field of Stream, the Sports, uh, sports of Field. And so I lived the outdoors vicariously. I started going through all the books that I could find on the mountain men, uh, fur trappers, exploration of the West. And so I, I came to know and admire some of the, the famous ones. And, and the one that deeply impressed me, and he still does, was Jedediah Smith. He was unique uh, among the mountain men. He uh, carried a Bible with him. He read it every day. He didn't cuss or swear. Uh, he didn't drink. He didn't smoke. And as I said, he did not have anything to do with, or he didn't consort with, what was the terminology? Well, you know, with loose women. He <laughs> was just really special. The movie that I think it was TNT or TBS did a series a number of years ago, uh, started off with him, part of the first group of fur trappers with, the, with uh, Ashley and, and, and Henry as they came up to Missouri and, and came into the West. And it told the story of him having an encounter with the grizzly bear and having his scalp mostly ripped off. And, and he just asked one of his guys, you know, sew it back on, you know? And I, just an incredible guy. And so at 16, moved to Utah. All of a sudden, I was free to go up into the hills. Uh, we did in Provo, Utah. Go up into the hills uh, with my dad's 22 rifle, uh, and then up the mountains, up Y Mountain, and up Rock Canyon, uh, off the mountain down in the Utah Valley area. I had some wonderful adventures. But some of my buddies, towards the end of June, said, Hey, let's go up into the Uendas for the fish opener. Back in those days, the fish opener was the first Saturday in July every year. We were all working, we got up work Friday afternoon, we got to my old 39 Plymouth, drove up over Wolf Creek Pass, which was a dirt road back then, up uh, North Fork of the Shane River to the bottom of Hades Canyon where the Phase Dew Ranch is still. <coughs> and we hiked all night up Hades Canyon, and it was really rough, especially in the dark, I guess. Uh, we got there just as it was getting light in the morning, fish, but you know, we didn't know what we were doing as far as backpacking went. We, uh, the, the terminology, lightweight backpacking, we hadn't heard about that yet. We were carrying a watermelon, uh, <laughs> Irish root beer in quart glass bottles, uh, cans of pork and beans. And so we didn't really know what we were doing. Three of the six decided they would never, ever go backpacking again. The three of us got hooked on it. We loved it. And these three, we started learning about it, and eventually by the time we graduated from high school, I made a backpack across the entire, what was called back then, the primitive area. The high unit primitive area. It was 239,000 acres about half the size of the present uh, wilderness area. And so it, it, uh, we started at Hades Canyon, went all the way across the Uinta River. It was really a real adventure. But I swore back then that before my life was over, I was going to explore, photograph, and report on all of the Uintas. Well, it's a long story, but I got, and if you want to know this early story, I have it on my website now. I, I call it my checkered uh, 
faith and work journey. Uh, checkered because there were some devious kind of aspects of my life. Uh, and I I decided I wasn't going to hide any of that kind of stuff. Uh, but I uh, I got detoured into Central America. For 35 years, I lived and worked among the Mayan Indians in Guatemala. In 2002, I came back. I guess I should say this, as we were getting ready to go, in 1967 it was, an elderly neighbor of the Cannon family, she came out and she said, just laughing, she said, I'll give you six months and you'll come running home with your tail between your legs. And I thought, I've prepared for this for years. I will not get her satisfaction. I will die first. <laughs> well, we finally came, or I finally came running home with my tail between my legs. It was 35 years later. Uh, and I'm actually still involved. Uh, and there's some parts here that, 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 where there's a website to the Guatemalan Foundation, which I still run. There's some representatives I have down there. But came back in 2002, uh, lived in Springfield, Utah. And then I decided, okay, now what uh, am I going to do? Uh, maybe it's about time I get started on this UNA thing. Uh, I was raising five children as a Mr. Mom, but they were getting old enough so they could be alone for periods of time. And so in 2003, I started my High School in the Wilderness project. After a couple of warm up trips to get in shape, I took off from the uh, Highline Trailhead on the Rear Lake Road for my 27-day expedition, I call it. A no resupply expedition. I had 83 pounds on my back, around my waist. I prepared for this for years by walking around my farm in Guatemala two or three times a week with a 100-pound bag of fertilizer on my back. And so I was able to do it. But I made that trip, and it was basically along the spine of the Uintas. 236 miles. And I zigzagged back and forth the, from one drainage to one side or the other. But I finally made that trip. And then I thought, you know, I've just seen the spine of the Uintas. There's all these drainages that come up to the spine of the Uintas. And so I started on the south slope. All the drainages coming up towards the spine. And then on the north slope. And this is really important for all of you folks from Summit County. On the far edge of, of Summit County, there are tributaries to Sheep Creek that go down into Fleming Gorge. So they start actually in Summit County. And then there's Dry Gulch. Then there's Beaver Creek, several forks. Henry's Fork, Smith's Fork, Black's Fork, with little bikes, uh, little uh, uh, little bikes fork, and uh, east bikes fork, and then middle bikes fork, and then west bikes fork, and then you come to the divide. All of those are all forks of the Green River. Very very important for, uh, for for the west. From the divide, on I think what they call Elizabeth Ridge, then they all go into the Great Salt Lake. <coughs> where you've got the Bear River, which uh, actually is, is unique in that uh, it, it starts in the Uintas, goes north into Wyoming, swings around through Idaho, makes a U-turn, comes back into Utah, and, and drains into the Great Salt Lake, 500 miles long. It's the longest river in the hemisphere that doesn't empty into an ocean. <coughs> and then you have the Weaver. And it seems like most of the people I know from Summit County, it's like the Weaver is all, is, that's Summit County. But the, it's just the farther, farther western edge of Summit County. All these other rivers that are so important uh, are all part of, of Summit County. And then even the Provo River starts in Summit County. I won't mention the ones on the Southern Slope because that's not part of Summit County. But Summit County is, is, uh, is the area where I have done most of the work, especially in this area, this mysterious area, an area 
that, that not too many people understand. And I'll admit, as I started up the drainages on the, on the North Slope, and I, I started seeing cabins, ruins, I thought, what was going on up here? Well, I thought, well, it was Jedediah Smith, maybe, in the fur cabins, or pioneers. But then I, I went up one drainage where it seemed like nobody else had been up there. I couldn't see any tracks of anybody that I got up there ahead of me. And the next year I went up there again and still I didn't see any tracks of people. This was the middle court of Black Fork, just a big empty space on the map. And I was heading for an above timberline lake called Bob's Lake. But along the way, I saw more ruins there than any other drainage that I had gone up, and I got up all the drainages by then. But there was more there. I did, and I actually have a, uh, what I call a photo essay on my website, and, and I actually asked the question, what the heck was going on up here? Well, a little while later, I made a trip up the west fork of Smith Fork. You go up, uh, to get to it, you go past the Huinta Guard Station. And as I was going by there, I noticed that there was a, there was a pickup truck parked there. And I thought, well, I'll see who's there. And I went and I met Teresa and Bob Bassanelli. I think they live in Green River, <coughs> how we call And we were talking all kinds of stuff. Uh, Teresa was a wilderness ranger. She went on horseback. But just as I was leaving, I said, oh, and by the way, do you guys know what the heck was happening up in the middle work of Black Sword? And wow, I talked about a can of worms. <laughs> she started, and Bob, her husband, they started opening up to my uh, empty mind, I guess we could say, because I was one of these low information backpackers. I was going through all this beautiful country, but I didn't know any of the history. But all of a sudden, I learned the terminology, which most Utahns don't know. Summit County is, a, is an exception. This is about the only place that I've found people that know about the tie hackers. Do you know about the tie hackers? Okay, there are a few. I went to the Utah Historical Society and said, I would like all the information or references to all the information you have on the tie hackers. He didn't even know what I was talking about. We finally found some photographs down in a box in the basement. And that's all I could get from the Utah Historical Society. How do you spell that, what you're saying? Tie hackers. T-I-E? Or tie hacks. T-I-E-H-A-C-K-E-R-S. Tie hackers. Now the ties we're talking about are railroad ties. Oh. Not, you know, not the Mormon missionary kind. <laughs> But I, I started learning about them. I, I probably the first place I went to was the Bear River Ranger Station on the Mirror Lake Road, just before you get to Wyoming, and that's in Summit County too. And there they had a tie hacker cabin out back. It was dismantled at what's called the Steel Creek Commissary, which was a tie hacker camp over on Still Creek, which is right next to West Fork of Smith's Fork, between there and Henry's Fork. Uh, so there was a commissary there. That was in about eight, 1928. And I learned that that cabin that Teresa and Bob were in was actually a cabin built by the tie hackers in 1928. But this cabin was dismantled at the Steel Creek site and reconstructed over there at the Bear River Ranger Station. Another one was taken down and reconstructed at the Mountain View Ranger Station in, in Mountain View, Wyoming. Uh, and there I took pictures also of all the, the, the steps in, in making these uh, railroad ties. I better explain just a little bit because uh, not too many people know about the tie hackers. Um, in 1867, the Transcontinental Railroad was being built across the United States, coming across Wyoming. They needed millions of railroad ties, from 2,800 to 3,000 per mile. 
And so they sent Irish lumbermen into the north slope of the Uinta Mountains and the mountains in Wyoming too. The Wind River, for example, is a big, big project. Uh, but in the north slope of the Uintas, they were almost all Irish lumbermen, immigrants. And they worked, lived and worked 12 months a year. And most of their work was done in the wintertime when they could transport the, their ties over the snow using sleds. And they would accumulate them in certain points in the drainage where they would build temporary dams across, called splash dams. And so they'd accumulate the ties. When the runoff would come and these dams would fill up, they'd blow with dynamite and down would go the ties into Wyoming where they'd be picked up by the railroad. Now these tie hackers, of course, had to go along with them to keep them from snagging and jamming and all that. Uh, and there were uh, people that lost their lives doing this. And so those were the, the original tie hackers. 1867 up to about 1880. I gave a speech about these people in uh, Evanston last year. And I entitled my speech, the Thai Hackers, Unsung American Heroes, without whom the West might not have been won. Without these railroad ties, there wouldn't have been a transcontinental railroad. They were key people, and they were tough people. Really tough, strong, weekends, they were heavy drinkers, usually. But I started learning about them. The Ranger Service Office in, in Edison got copies of everything they had on the Thai Hackers. I did the same thing over in Mountain View. Uh, and then I went to the public libraries in Mountain View, in Lyman, in Evanston. And I started learning about places like uh, some of the ghost towns. I've already seen and photographed one of the ones that, that is right along the road that comes out of the East Fork of Bikes Fork and goes north into Wyoming. It's the old Bikes Fork Commissary. And that was to supply the tie hacker camps uh, up in the mountains. And, and they had usually, a, a, in a big camp, like a, a commissary, they did have a school, uh, a general store, a uh, livery stable, of course, uh, um, saloons, brothels. But there I started hearing about some really special ones. Piedmont, Piedmont goes down, so I went to Piedmont, this is in Wyoming. All the wood, uh, there were charcoal kilns there, and all the wood that was used there came out of the winds. I was fascinated by it. There were no trespassing signs along the road. You can go to the kilns, there's three of them left, and there's a very nice explanation there about what uh, the whole process of making charcoal. This was a community established by a Moses Byrne. Later, his uh, brother-in-law from the Guild family joined them in Piedmont. This became a little community had a, a two-story boarding house and uh, once again the general store, saloons, post office, the whole works. Uh, soldiers from Fort Bridger would come to Piedmont uh, for their rest and recreation on the weekends uh, oftentimes. But I noticed there was a cemetery and they didn't say no trespassing so I went to the cemetery I took a picture of every single uh, tombstone in the, in the cemetery and I did a little math 56% of everybody that was buried there, and there were some unmarked graves, and we don't know about them, but 56% of those that were marked with dates and all, were all children who had died. From 15 down, mostly in the first, either stillborn in the first year or two or three of life. So it was 56% were dead by the time they were 15. The pioneer life was not easy even in Piedmont. And I thought, and I noticed that there was, there was one, uh, someone had been buried there in 1998. And one in 1996. And so I thought, well, you know, on uh, Memorial Day, I've got to come and camp out at the cemetery in, in Piedmont uh, <coughs> to visit with the living or the dead, whichever, and learn more about it. So last uh, year, I did that. And all of a sudden, here comes a pickup truck. And I met Kelly Lucio um, Crumpton. <coughs> it was her husband, uh, along with her, uh, who had died in an airplane accident in Montana. 
and he was the one buried there in 1996. And then it was a brother that was buried there in 1998, and she would come with her new husband, J.D. Uh, Busio, uh, to put uh, flowers on the graves every Memorial Day. And so I met them and learned all kinds of things. And then they uh, helped me make a contact with the matriarch of the, of the uh, uh, Byrne family, uh, Faye, Faye Crompton, from Orem. And I was living in Springfield then. And so I went and visited with her and her husband and got all kinds of good information and some pictures. And, and so I was learning about Piedmont. So it's just a fascinating story.